My name is David Thorpe and I'm the Special Consultant on Sustainable Cities Collective, the foremost website for urban leaders everywhere. Now in the field of sustainable cities, Herbert Girardet's name is legendary. He has made the discipline his life's work. Besides being the author of 11 books on the subject, he is also co-founder of the World Future Council. But now he's left the concept of sustainability behind, moving on to define a new, more dramatic concept, the idea of regenerative cities. And that is the theme of his new book, Creating Regenerative Cities. Welcome, Herbert. Having admired your work for a long time, it's a great pleasure to talk to you. Oh, hello, David. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Good. Now, perhaps you could start by explaining what you mean by a regenerative city. Yeah. Basically, the way cities use resources at the, at the, at the present time, they suck in all manner of food and uh, energy resources and uh, metals and all the rest of it without giving a second thought about the impact of that resource use on the world's environment. That is a critical issue in an urbanizing world. The reality is that as more than half the world's people now live in cities, with that figure going up very, very rapidly indeed, if we do not give back to nature uh, nutrients from farmland, uh, uh, you know, all manner of water resources that we don't take care of, if we don't power our cities with renewable energy or regenerative energy, basically we are on a hiding to nothing. We will run out of resources, we will destroy the world's environments in ways that are completely uh, unacceptable, uh, particularly when it comes to looking at the chance of future generations to li live a decent life. So we need to do everything we possibly can to regenerate ecosystems in the process of using their resources. And that means giving back rather than simply taking from nature. And that is a really critical issue uh, in the 21st century. Now the first half of your book sets out the problem before you go on to the solutions. And you, you call this the idea of Petropolis. And Petropolis represents the antithesis of the regenerative city. Could you just give us a quick picture of what Petropolis is like? Well, basically, uh, since the Industrial Revolution, cities in the West, but now globally, have come to use fossil fuel resources as their main energy base. And that is certainly a critical issue uh, for, for the coming years and decades. The fact is, uh, fossil fuels are running out. We are using them for all kinds of uh, aspects of our daily lives. Uh, London, for instance, as a city of seven and a half million people, uses the equivalent of about a super tanker, two super tankers of oil per week, in order to power its the houses, the buildings, the transport systems, and the transport systems that bring in resources from elsewhere. So certainly, the critical issue is: uh, can we find ways of not having cities as entropic systems which uh, degrade resources in the process of using them, but instead can we find ways of powering our cities, not with fossil fuels, but with renewable energies. That certainly is a huge challenge because uh, energy density from fossil fuels is very, very high. So uh, to use renewable energies is a much greater uh, challenge than uh, many people think. So. Uh, surely switching to 100% renewable energy for a city is not sufficient, though, to be re fully regenerative. Um, what other things do we need to do, for instance, dealing with other resources that may be about to run out? Well, for instance, take, take food. I mean, we take for granted food supplies from absolutely everywhere, but the reality is that we are using uh, fertilizers in order to keep farmland productive, whilst at the same time discharging sewage uh, through our sewage systems into into aquatic systems into the oceans, that is the global process where we are. When we are looking at coastal waters, we are seeing dead zones, about 50 major dead zones in the coastal areas where major cities and farmland is located. So we are not giving uh, the uh, nutrients, plant nutrients, used in food production back to farmland. We are only basically uh, replacing these nutrients by artificial means with artificial fertilizers. So the critical issue is, for instance, to create sewage systems that regenerate and give back to farmland the nutrients and the carbon that we take out of farmland. This is just one of the many ways in which cities can become regenerative. 
Another aspect is water supply. For instance, if you look at New York as a huge city region, uh, much of the uh, uh, f water used in New York is, comes from the Catskills, where very large areas of uh, uh, forest have been regenerated in order to ensure that uh, naturally supplied water uh, can be produced there. So these are the kind of measures, reforestation, uh, plant nutrients, giving back to farmland, that are absolutely critical, quite apart from renewable energy to assure that cities become regenerative systems. So the second half of the book is all about solutions like this and I, I must admit I do like the example you give of the cat skills um, as, well of your, as one of your case studies but before going yeah. on to that you do introduce the concept of urban metabolism which I think is central yeah. to your thesis. What is urban metabolism? Well, basically, you know, all living systems have a metabolism, and if you take cities as a living system, then you would say that we are, you know, it's basically the, the uh, throughput of resources into a living system, and the reality is that the present time cities take input of resources from somewhere in nature for granted, and then they, uh, we chuck out waste in enormous quantities, whether they're aquatic or liquid or uh, solid waste that end up somewhere in nature. And that certainly is the example or the, the concept of the linear metabolism of cities. Nature is an essentially circular system where all wastes produced by nature, such as the leaves that fall off a tree, uh, you know, are basically turned into new growth uh, in due course. And so certainly, if we are serious about an urbanizing world, we cannot continue to run cities as linear metabolic systems as we currently do. So there's a critical issue here that needs to be addressed by policy makers, but by, by urban citizens, by all of us who have some concern about the future of humanity. So we're now beginning to get an idea of what you mean by ecopolis, which you, which you put paint as the, the opposite of petropolis. It's a lovely idea. And um, amongst its features, you suggest is the concept that we should each only consume about 2,000 watts. Now, this, this is already in practice. Apparently, it's an idea that began in Switzerland. How popular is, is this idea already? Well, it hasn't been implemented yet in Switzerland. There's work going on in Zurich and in Basel and other Swiss cities to try and reduce the throughput of energy to something like that level, currently about five to 6,000 watts per person. Now, one thing we need to look at is if, if you look at the energy output that a human body is capable of, it's only about a thousand, uh, about 100 watts, but we are on a daily basis across Europe using about 6,000 watts in America, double that figure. So we have an enormous challenge to try and get uh, down to, uh, from in significant ways, from our current uh, 6,000 watts or so in Europe, elsewhere, as I said, in America, double that figure in Australia too, by the way. So, certainly in Switzerland, there's now active initiatives in this direction where uh, it is shown that in the 1960s, uh, Swiss uh, citizens used about 2,000 uh, watts per person. So that means, obviously, energy efficiency in buildings, in transport systems, uh, reduced reliance on the motor car, and all the various measures that you know the environmental movement has been talking about for years. And it's certainly per perfectly feasible for us to do that. But then the, the critical question is, if we become more energy efficient in individual activities, are we going to then increase the range of activities that we are engaged in, consuming more and more uh, other things so that we'll continue to ramp up our energy use uh, you know, in, in, in various other ways. So certainly the question of personal responsibility as well as policy measures in this uh, direction are critically important. When I say policy measures, is actively encouraging people to consume less rather than simply replacing an energy consuming activity that has been reduced in impact by other consumption measures. So that is a critical issue and it also very much directs us in, in the direction of you know, really seriously thinking about the future and how we as individuals need to take ethical responsibility for the way we use energy. Of course, the question then arises, can we replace the current input of fossil fuels into our urban systems with renewable energy? And there's certainly a lot of, you know, examples now from around the world where this is beginning to happen. Cities like Copenhagen 
or I, I worked in Australia and Adelaide where we are showing that uh, it's a really significant proportion of the energy now supplied in these places coming from wind power and from solar power. All this is great stuff, but it would be an illusion to think that we can do this from within the urban territory. Uh, cities are usually quite densely built up areas, and so certainly to have enough surfaces for solar energy or to have enough places where we can have wind power within city uh, environments is very, very difficult indeed. So that's why we need to look back at how cities in the past were connected closely to the uh, en environment around cities, not only from the point of view of bringing in energy resources, but also food resources. It is perfectly possible to reconnect much more closely to the local environment of cities rather than relying on global supplies as we currently do. And that's certainly part of the story of creating uh, regenerative cities, or as, as I use the term, ecopolis in this context. By the way, this term has been used quite a bit by other people as well, not just by myself. Sure. Um, but you do have a, a vast amount of experience which you've distilled into this remarkably concise book. And um, I, I'm wondering uh, if there are any other things that you've left out of the book, for instance, perhaps some case studies from Africa or other developing countries, uh, which you might like to share with us. Well, I personally have worked um, in various cities, uh, particularly in Europe. Uh, uh, I did a lot of work on London, kind of defining London's metabolism some years ago, simply quantifying the problems, the resource use problems of a huge urban system such as London, which I did about 20 years ago. And we came to the conclusion that London, uh, in terms of its ecological footprint, uh, which is derived in, in numerical terms from a quantitative analysis of its resource throughput requires a surface area of roughly the size of the, all the productive land in England. And some more recent studies have, in fact, doubled this figure to up to 300 times London's surface area. So, so certainly, I've been involved in studies of this kind myself, and uh, I've worked in Adelaide, Australia, a lot, where we went, then took it a stage further and say, okay, we have a major problem with how cities can sustain themselves uh, with resources in, in, in a regenerative way, what can we do in practical terms to try and implement measures to kind of change the way these cities work? So 10 years ago, I was asked to be a thinker in residence in Adelaide to try and come up with ideas for how this city could be transformed in terms of its resource use. And I'm pleased to say 10 years later, really a major uh, transformation has been achieved through policy measures by the government of South Australia and the city government of Adelaide itself. I was also involved in uh, developing ideas for eco-cities in China, particularly the Dongtan Eco-City Project uh, on an island off Shanghai called Chongming Island. Unfortunately, that project hasn't impl been implemented so far, but it is certainly true that it has been very influential in planning policy terms throughout China and we can look forward to much more sensitive and I would say regenerative urban development measures in uh, countries like China where currently uh, urbanization is rampant and until recently has not been very concerned about the, the implications for resource use and for pollution and all these uh, externalities uh, that uh, have uh, reared their ugly head. Uh, air pollution for instance in Chinese cities as we know is a huge problem but the question of how uh, that air pollution trans translates to climate change is only now being considered and hopefully will be coming up at the COP20 and 21 conferences, climate change conferences of the UN uh, this, this year and next year. So there's certainly a lot of thinking going on about how an urbanizing world will become or could become compatible with the world's ecosystems. But so far, when it comes to actually impl Im implementing solutions, we are still very far off the mark at this moment in time. People yeah. are still wanting to build petropolis rather than ecopolis across the world. That's right. And of course the will has to be there for, for a city to become a regenerative system. And uh, not just the will, but there has to be training, there has to be accountability. And this kind of 
uh, if you like, structure inbuilt into society has to is especially lacking in, in developing countries. So how can we overcome yeah. these challenges so that they they don't people there don't make the same mistakes as, as are being made in cities like Dubai and Saudi Arabia that you document in your book? But they seem to yeah. they seem to want to emulate, don't they? Well, certainly, when you look at these Middle Eastern cities, and I've done quite a lot of work in, in recent years uh, in, in, in the Middle East, particularly in Saudi Arabia, I mean, we are staring at monstrous urban systems in the face there. It's just extraordinary mm. how, of course, countries that are so, uh, you know, rich in fossil fuels then build cities that are utterly dependent uh, on, on powering their cities in this way. But when it comes to, for instance, Saudi Arabia, it's a very interesting story. Uh, it is expected that under current trends, uh, this you know world's largest exporter of oil could require all the all the oil resources that are currently produced in Saudi Arabia for its own use. Already, it's about thirty percent of the oil produced in that country and are used within the country itself hmm. for you know running uh, SUVs. You know, with the the price of petrol there is about twelve. Uh, cents, you know, euro cents a, a liter. So you can imagine how people waste that uh, re uh, precious resource. I mean, it is not really regarded as a precious resource. It's simply pumped out of the ground at very low cost. But so beginning to realize, you know, the, the leaders, the, the policymakers in that country are beginning to realize that this cannot continue. But now the quest is there to try and implement projects that show that one can run a city, a country with two or three large cities that are so totally dependent on fossil fuels in different ways. So there is now a certain amount of renewable energy development taking place there, but also in, in other parts of the Middle East. But it's all very much at the beginning. Mm. Abu Dhabi has taken these uh, uh, questions or these issues a little bit further by creating the Mazda City uh, EcoCity project, but it is very rudimentary and it's only about 5 to 10 percent of the original idea for creating this EcoCity project has so far be, been implemented. Nevertheless, in Abu Dhabi there's quite a substantial investment now taking place in renewable energy and some of that is some of that money is actually coming all the way to Europe, like for instance the London Array, the large, the world's largest wind farm in the Thames Estuary is part funded by Abu Dhabi. So there are interesting developments of this kind, but it's never enough. We are sort of gradually heading in a better direction, but it's all still too little, and if we are not careful, too late. Uh -huh.